Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 11th episode of Designing on the Front Lines, the show that brings together doctors, designers, and cool people to talk about some of the important issues around the pandemic and around current events. I'd like to welcome you all uh, to the show. We are co-sponsored by the Health Design Lab here at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital and Cooper Hewitt at the Smithsonian Museum, and I'm Morgan Hutchinson. Hey, guys, and I'm Matt Fields, and we are both emergency medicine physicians. Um, we also get to hang out at the Health Design Lab here at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. We're joined by our team and co-sponsors from the Health Design Lab, Bon Coo, Rob Puglisi, Christy Shine, Mary Ellen Daly, and all of our students who came from the lab. Hey guys, thanks for coming. And for Keeper Hewitt, we have Ellen Lupton and Pam Horn. And oh, Morgan, did you mention, I'm really sad. This is our next to the last episode. I didn't, I didn't want to start on a bad foot. Oh, okay. But yeah, hmm. unfortunately. But it is Friday, the 24th of July, crazy. That is our second to last episode and COVID is still rising in our state here in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia and across the country. But Matt, what were you, uh, pointing out, I think this- uh, The one place where news. COVID hasn't been rising is um, New Jersey. And, yeah, uh, so. New Jersey always gets bad rap, but <laughs> uh, doing pretty well COVID relatively. So I like to- Anyway, uh, we've got <laughs> three awesome speakers today. So I wanna get started quickly. I wanna let you all know, I'm about to post a survey about the show into the chat box, and then I'll send another link to it later on. Um, please let us know what you think about the show. If this is your first show, or if you've been to many other episodes, we would love to hear from you. Today, we've got three excellent speakers. We have Michelle Flood, pharmacist and designer, Dr. Andrew Ibrahim, and uh, Robert Fabricant. Um, we also have Kimberly Dowdell and, um, and uh, Priya Mishra. We also have one themed breakout room um, in between speakers, so get ready. All right, everybody, remember we want to see your lovely faces, so please turn your video on. Just press up, you know, there's that little button up in the top right corner to turn your video on so we can see you. Uh, use the chat box to tell us who you are, where you're from, and shoot out any questions for our speakers. We'll try, if we have time, to do a Q&A session, but we do have a lot of speakers this week, so we apologize ahead of time if we don't get to that, but still ask your questions because people can answer them within the chat. And if you missed any of our previous episodes, go to healthdesignlab.com slash DOTFL. Let's get right into it. First, we have Music Minutes with our producer, Rob Puglisi. Whoa, I'm first? That's crazy. Um, all right, everybody, today's beer is brought to you by, no, just kidding, but isn't this can beautiful? I just wanna show you everybody. This is from a brewery right around the corner for me called Tired Hands. Why is Zoom doing that? And it is a delicious sour sangria ale and uh, it's very strong. So if I start babbling, just tell me to shut up. Um, today's music was brought to you by Mavis Staples. Uh, who here actually knew that Mavis Staples is still making albums? Yeah. So she came out with an album in 2019 and it's called We Get By. And, uh, you know, somebody with as much, uh, you know, uh, history and knowledge as Mavis knows how to read the world at any point in time, but man, does that album really make, make a lot of sense these days. So I suggest you go out and you listen to it. It is like, uh, Medicine for the soul. Uh, that being said, I'll turn it over to you, Morgan. You're muted. Sorry. <laughs> All right, we'll go straight to our design find of the week with Colleen Clark. Oh, uh, Colleen's also muted. There you go. Yes. <laughs> hey, everybody. Um, I think I also need screen sharing capabilities, if I can be granted that by the powers that be. But here's to see everyone. So sad there's less than two hours left of this awesomeness. Um, thanks, to everybody, who makes it happen. Let's see. All right. I continue with the screen share. Okay. All right, am I there? Nope. It was up for a second and then you went away. Okay, here we go. So Sweet. thank you, sorry for bearing with me. So today's design find has to do with back to school. This is something that is kind of on everybody's minds. And I have to say, I don't have kids. Um, so I haven't, don't have firsthand experience, but I know this is a really important topic. So 
considering we don't know what's going to happen and for everybody around the world, I'm sure it's different in your neighborhood and wherever you live, but two researchers, um, one from MIT and one from Harvard decided to tackle this question. What is it gonna look like? And who's involved in the decision-making process and how can we make it as equitable as possible? So they came out with these two reports and um, once I'm done sharing, I'll link it in the chat so you can go check them out. I highly recommend it. I'm still digging through it. Um, but the first report outlines a participatory design framework to help communities uh, negotiate the challenges of schooling. And it also has colorful storyboards of ideas that came from all of their uh, brainstorming and uh, design sessions. So these were just, this is a list, so I won't go through all of them, but these were some of the seven uh, key insights that they listed that I thought were really interesting. And they also were referring to Marie Kondoing school priorities, which is kind of like a, a playful way to put it. Uh, the second report was actually this whole framework for how to do charrettes. So part of all of this, they invited uh, teachers, parents, administrators, all kinds of people to do three um, design charrettes. And then they also did one design charrette with eighth graders. So real quick, for those who don't know what a design charrette is, because we have a wonderful group of multidisciplinary attendees. So it's just an intensive multidisciplinary design workshop that involves major, a lot of different stakeholders exchanging ideas normally pretty quickly, a lot of ideating. Um, they tend to be a lot of fun. I don't know, what, uh, and there's a lot of different definitions, but this sort of is the one that kind of summarizes it. Uh, so in the design charrette with eighth graders, you all know if you've seen my previous finds, I love sharing things that involve kids and designing with kids. Um, but they had them do a design charrette for about an hour, and this is some sketch notes um, from some of their ideas. But some of the students' ideas included things like eSports recreation leagues with teacher and student teams. And then also uh, hosting class on Minecraft and Fortnite. And then also proposing de designing or designating home as a place for curriculum and then school is a place for relationships. So that I thought was really interesting how like dividing this, those physical spaces for different things. So this is one of the quotes um, that came up that I thought really would resonate uh, in terms of COVID and healthcare spaces as well, that you wanna let people closest to the ground innovate. Um, and so these reports really, really emphasize that and also the importance of flexibility. Um, I won't go with this in my last slide. These are the last two main takeaways. And when you click on the um, article, you'll see. So these aren't my words, but I just thought these were great. Values eat logistics for breakfast and for ownership to equity. So that's the whole power of participatory design, how we can move towards equitable solutions towards in this really, dare I say it, unprecedented times. And so a lot of this from the frameworks, from the school and involved people in the school school community, uh, I thought it would be really interesting to try to take some of those and apply them to healthcare. What would a uh, healthcare charrette look like around this topic? All right, back to you, Morgan, if I'm passing it back to you. Thank you so much, Colleen. And I am not on mute this time, so that is the good news. Awesome design find, excellent music. Thank you guys so much. And it's time to get into our first speaker. Michelle Flood is a lecturer at the School of Pharmacy and Biomolecular Science at the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, and she's a visiting researcher at the Design Institute Dell Medical School at UT Austin. She's interested in how design can support um, resolution to more complex issues in healthcare and, um, and leads an interdisciplinary group of researchers addressing challenges in preventative care, medication safety, and medical education. Welcome, Michelle. Hi everyone, um, my name is Michelle and I'm delighted to join you from Dublin in Ireland where it's, it's just after 10 p.m. Um, I'm mainly a lecturer in the School of Pharmacy as Morgan just said, a visiting researcher at, at DELMED and um, I'm also teaching and learning research fellow uh, focusing on interdisciplinarity and policy for higher education in Ireland. So I have three jobs at the moment. Um, just by way of background, um, just why is this random person ringing in from Ireland at 10 p.m.? Um, I am a pharmacist originally, and I um, worked in, in primary care for a number of years before moving to academia. Um, when I was moving towards academia, I started to wonder, you know, are we really training people to meet the needs of patients? I mean, I could resolve complex medical issues, but it was medicines issues, but it was, it was difficult to understand what to do with patients who were lonely or patients who you know, didn't have access to care. So I, I got interested, I suppose, in medical education and my PhD is in uh, education. I still did some health services research and I kind of started to look towards design. Um, where can you call me designer? I would not call myself a designer, as you can see, but uh, I 
like to use design principles to try and address some problems because I find they're useful. And then I suppose closing out that loop, if design is useful for health professionals, how do we teach it? Or you know, what should teaching design to um, health professional students look like? And I kind of work within those three domains. Um, I suppose it's the question around medical education that took me to the States in 2018 um, to the amazing team at the Design Institute for Health at Dell Medical School. And I was really lucky there to work with um, a great team. Fulbright is very much based on the ethos exchange. So I brought my expertise in, in education research and I've set up a longitudinal study following their first cohort of design track students um, over the, the first few years of their career. So I've spoken with them at baseline. So before they started, I met them this year again to understand you know, what had the, their design track choice um, meant for them as they progress through the rest of medical school. And I'll follow them up again in, in two years just to see has it impacted on, on their practice at all. So um, as far as I know, uh, it's the first kind of study of that sort. Um, I brought home with me a huge experience working on many projects. So I worked on the Austin State Hospital redesign with the team there in telehealth projects and some screening programs um, and also contributed to the, the educational program. The timing worked really well when I came back to Ireland um, a great funding call had just opened up. So just by way of background, the Oireachtas Committee, so government committee in the, on the future of healthcare has been formed and there's a cross party agreement. So all political parties, you know, even if they're not on the best of terms normally, have agreed to a long term vision for health. It's called Slauncha Care. So Slauncha, you might know it from drinking, but actually means health. Um, and it, it's looking towards and um, designing a universal single tier uh, health and social system where everybody has access to service based on need and not the ability to pay. And that's something I'm obviously very in favor of. Uh, 20 million euro uh, funding was opened up for projects that were going to use innovative ways to um, support preventative health and social care. And I was already involved in a, in a national project looking to um, implement brief interventions across uh, all health professions, education in Ireland. So most of the clinical people will know what a brief intervention is. It's a structured short conversation with a healthcare professional um, that's done during a routine visit. So just like any screening test, like a blood pressure screening, for example. And it, um, they're really effective, they're really cheap, but they're not really done. So, Anyone that knows Stacey Chan will probably know as well, he, he hates waiting rooms. So uh, I learned when I was in the States that actually waiting is a waste. So what I wanted to do was try and say, look, well, I want to bring together the government policy with my experience in working in brief interventions with what I'd learned from the States and look at a, a kind of what is a complex problem. So my proposed solution was how we could leverage waiting time in routine healthcare delivery and primary care to overcome barriers to brief intervention delivery. So how might that work? So I was very lucky to be able to assemble an amazing team of, you know, quite, a, quite diverse backgrounds, a lot of, you know, kind of design colleagues, but also biostatistics, organizational and health psychology, and um, a, a partner, a commercial partner, a really great company called Frontend, to try and, uh, you know, secure some funding. So we were lucky to get the equivalent of about $390,000. Um, I were one of these dots, 122 uh, projects were funded across the, the country of Ireland. So our solution was that we would try and digitize um, the first part of a brief intervention to overcome. Uh, a lot of health professionals feel uncomfortable raising the question of, say, alcohol smoking. They just, you know, kind of feel you don't want to raise an issue that's kind of, you know, nagging or potentially unpleasant. So we can automate that so the person can do that while they're waiting. We then facilitate a structured conversation as part of the brief intervention um, after that, but the health profession already has the information from the patient uh, from the, the, the initial consultation. And then instead of just saying, oh, you should go to yoga or you should go to see um, an alcohol support group, actually linking into services specifically in the area um, via a printed ticket. So that came together to our health air project and it's a collaboration funded by the government of Ireland that's launched care project and um, a collaboration across four universities so it's a great project but coronavirus arrived smack in the middle of when um, we were supposed to be rolling out so it made us fundamentally question um, 
you know, what is it to do design research really? Like, what does it, does that matter? Is that important? Um, but just to give you a little bit of a, an overview of coronavirus in Ireland, our first case here was in on the 29th of February, 2020. Um, it was someone returning from skiing in Italy. It's a very common thing to do to go skiing in Italy from Ireland, it's quite nearby. Um, the schools and colleges closed the week my project started, so we had to shut down and we had to um, all go home and my two staff had just started. Um, most businesses and venues are closed from 24th of March to the 18th of May and we're now, thankfully, there was 20 new cases today um, only in Ireland. It's really, you know, people really got on board with the measures and it's, it's quite contained. Thankfully, nobody has passed away today um, and there's five patients out of five million in ICU today. So it's, it's improved quite a lot. Um, we were lucky in that our Taoiseach, which would be the equivalent of, I suppose, your Donald Trump, uh, was a doctor and um, a medical doctor. So uh, he and our, um, the, the person represented on the right is Dr. Tony Holland, who's our chief medical officer, um, were very well respected and showed very strong leadership um, during the pandemic. Um, Recently, in the past week or so, our, our, our app, a contact tracing app was launched and um, more than 30% of the population have already downloaded it. So that would be like more than 100 million Americans downloading the app. Um, and our health service has um, made the, the code open source. So, you know, there were some good parts. Unfortunately, there were some bad parts as well. We were, had a very high um, rate of nursing home deaths, which is common internationally, but it's something that's going to be subject to public inquiry because it was so high. I suppose what the, in terms of these kinds of academic health design research projects that should really be being done in the field, um, things change fundamentally. I don't have time to go into it, but the, the original concept of health air, that EIR was supposed to be Ireland, but also an airplane analogy, which is now totally flat in the water. <laughs> no one wants to hear about air travel right now, so we had to kind of change that as well. People aren't waiting either. There's nowhere to wait. So facilities are asking people not to congregate. So, you know, it's, it's returning to normal. We had to decide if we should stop or keep going. We had the option to pause the project. And then we have to really think about, you know, was what we were doing even important? This week, I think, um, this quote really captured our, our perspective, and this is from a paper by a team based in Oxford in the UK. We have to kind of realize that I think from now on, things are going to be quite different, particularly for academic researchers um, who are used to dealing with, you know, kind of structured methods and, and modalities of research and also ethics committees and things like that, the UAB, it's quite difficult, but it's really kind of grounded us in, you know, look, you know, things are definitely not going to be perfect anymore. We as a team were challenged to what we could do differently. And we took the time to engage more deeply with academic research, which is something I found sometimes design doesn't necessarily do for, for different reasons, sometimes purposeful. Um, and we moved towards using simulation facilities where possible. So I'm looking to work in an institution that has the best simulation facilities in Europe. Um, and this is obviously a, not, a, this is not a research picture, this is just a standard picture, but we can do quite a lot in simulation. So again, this is our clumsy solution. Um, we have to evaluate how our imperfect responses can actually add knowledge in a different way. And I think that's just a fundamental way of thinking. And I just want to say one more thing before I go, because one of the things I've learned a lot from being at these um, weekly sessions is um, a lot about the, um, I suppose, on the untimely killing of uh, Mr. George Floyd. And um, it's also been interesting to understand, I suppose, the reach and the impact of that. So you guys might not be aware of, you know, the impact that it's had worldwide. And I've really appreciated everybody um, sharing their stories. When I was in the States, and I suppose kind of knowing a lot of my friends who are still in, in the US, it was very disappointing and very kind of unusual for me to hear that unfortunately a lot of Irish American art can be part of the problem. And it's something that um, when I saw this poem, I was like, I think I'll, I'll share the link to the, the um, artist uh, reciting it because I'm um, you know, a time and A, she doesn't want to use her own words. But this really spoke to me because you don't get to be racist and Irish. We come from um, a history of emigration and oppression. And it's been something that, um, you know, has kind of really stood out to me from, from the different uh, talks. So it's a really, I suppose, powerful poem from my perspective. And um, I would just like everybody to know who spoken and share their stories that we stand with you. So 
Thank you so much, Michelle. That's excellent. I love about waiting is a waste and um, and the concept of design research. We sure hope it's important because that's a uh, that's pretty much our jam around here. So thank mm. you so much for sharing. It's great to um, it's great to speak with you. Um, let's see. I'm going to turn it over to Matt for the breakout room. Okay. Um, thank you very much. And thank you, Michelle. That was wonderful. So we're going to go into a breakout room where we get to break out in groups of four to six and have a chance to meet with each other and get to know each other and say who you are, where you're from. And remember, if you get kicked off of Zoom, sometimes that happens. We don't know why. Just rejoin. This week's prompt. All right. So this week's prompt was inspired by a book that I recently discovered that was written by the very famous and sadly late Michael Sorkin. As many of you know, Michael Sorkin was one of the world's most important architects, designers, educators, and intellectuals of our time. And he sadly died this year at the age of 71 due to complications related to COVID. He wrote a book entitled 20 Minutes in Manhattan, in which Sorkin, he described in great detail, great detail his observation during his daily walk from Greenwich Village to his Tribeca office. And in so doing so, he kind of peels back layers of history, feats of engineering, artistry, just from that increased time and in thinking and observing, which is so important to, to design. So our prompt this week in honor of that is, have you noticed something during the pandemic that you didn't notice before in your own surroundings, in your own home, in your own work, maybe or even in nature or with people that you interact with, even your your pets maybe, or maybe even with yourself. So kind of a broader question and a bit deep, but I think hopefully very insightful. All right, welcome back everybody. I uh, hope we got to all meet somebody new and learn about some cool stuff. So um, are we all back? Looks like we're all back. All right, so next I'm gonna uh, turn it over to uh, Bon Koo, who is the director of the Health Design Lab, to introduce our next speaker. Well, we, we have uh, two speakers that we'll be uh, hearing from. And the first is uh, Kimberly Dowdell. She's based in Chicago. She's an architect at HOK. There she is the director well. of business development. And um, her mission is to improve the quality of life for people living in cities. So that's a, that's a lot of us here. And she's also president of the National Organization of Minority Architects. We also have a Andrew Ibrahim. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, he's also at HOK where he is the chief medical officer. And in his spare time, Andrew is a surgeon at the University of Michigan. Andrew thinks a lot about bridging the gap between architects and uh, ar architecture and healthcare. So I'll hand it over to you, Andrew. Awesome. Thanks so much, Bon. Thanks for organizing this and having us here. I think being four or five months in, it's there's been a lot of moments to slow down and pause and think, what is COVID trying to teach us? And how do we think about that through a design lens? So when we look at the burden of COVID, this is the updated data in the United States from the CDC just today that we're consistently hitting 60, 70,000 new cases. We're well over 4 million total. Um, and this really just hits the tip of the iceberg in terms of the burden of COVID. But what has been really alarming to me and um, really stood out is not just that there's a burden, but that it's a very uneven burden. So in almost every category we look at across any measurable outcome, um, blacks and minorities do worse in almost every category. So this was the headline of the New York Times um, that showed um, blacks and Latinos getting uh, the coronavirus at three and four times the rates of whites. And what's interesting here is Native Americans had even a higher rate than all of those groups and weren't even represented, almost underscoring the problem of our inability to understand disparities in light of COVID. If you, these same patterns persist when you look at who was able to get treated at hospitals, who died from COVID, who had an outcome that was um, improved. Um, so these patterns persist, but even if you go outside the walls of the hospital, um, the patterns are still there too. So this is unemployment rates by race before and after, um, before and during COVID, and the same patterns are there. In other words, the burden and who COVID has affected 
is disproportionately uneven in a systematic way. So my home base has almost always been in the medical field and spent a lot of time training with patient safety experts. And when we saw problems consistently repeat themselves, this was the phrase that we most often heard. Every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. And so when you see those patterns over and over from COVID, you have to step back and think, what is it about the way our healthcare delivery system is designed that it's so unfavorable to the same people over and over? But as I showed you, it's actually not just about healthcare, but the implications are much broader. So I spent a lot of time picking everyone's brain at HOK, and they were calling me too to ask for health advice and if I had inside secrets about the vaccine development or something, which I don't, uh, but keep calling, it's fun. Um, but I had a really thoughtful number of discussions. And as I um, talked to my colleague, Kimberly, who you hear from in a second, um, the phrase that really struck me, which I think should be something that we all take away from COVID is that at the core of equitable health are equitable cities. In other words, if we don't design cities in a way that are equitable, it is unrealistic of us to think that people are gonna have equitable health outcomes and healthcare experiences. Um, the pandemic stresses the system and it just underscores and highlights it and makes it available to us, but it's there um, and it has been there and COVID has just highlighted that for us. So um, I know a lot of people on this call can do um, a lot to talk about hospital design and, and things within healthcare deliberately, um, but I'd love to take this opportunity to hand things off to Kim to think a little one, one step back about what is it about cities that are not equitable that is having enormous impact on health? Yeah, uh, thank you, Andrew. And I, you know, I, would, um, I would echo everything that, that was just said and just you know, really underscore how um, you know, the disparities, again, that are being magnified by COVID right now, um, you know, have been there for a long time and unfortunately will be here if we don't act. Um, and you know, I, I think everyone knows that the um, about the Hippocratic Oath and, and to do no harm. And I think, um, you know, there's a, there's a similar um, sort of call uh, to action for architects that people don't talk about often. So I'm just going to share it with you all in case you don't know. And it's, it's uh, to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public. And so I think architects have to, um, you know, to do a, a better job of, of uh, calling out these disparities and, and leveraging design as a tool uh, to help to close the gaps. Um, and one of the gaps that comes to mind specifically is the wealth gap. Uh, there's a, a study from 2013 by Dr. Edward Wolf that shows that the median net worth of a white family in America is about $117,000. Um, but that same number for uh, an African-American family is about $1,700. And, and so that, I mean, just to talk about that disparity um, and how that translates into obviously fewer resources, which means, um, you know, uh, less access to the, to the things that people need. And um, that translates into, you know, unfortunately, uh, lower life expectancy. So unfortunately, in America, um, you know, your life expectancy, to some extent, is tied to your zip code. Um, and, you know, so many neighborhoods are um, either mostly black or mostly white, and there's not a, a ton of, um, you know, of, of mixture at, at this point. And, and certainly, there are communities that are Latinx and, and Asian, and, and there are communities that, that do have good mixture, but, um, you know, what we're going to see as we go forward, and um, Andrew, if you could take it to the next slide, is that, you know, our cities are going to become uh, more dense. Uh, in fact, in the U.S. right now, uh, there are about 310 million people living in cities, um, but by 2050, there will be 439 million people living in cities, so we're going to have a much more uh, dense uh, environment within which to uh, to live, work, and play. And so architects, um, and really it's not just about architects. I mean, we're, um, you know, we're one of the, the great professions as, as I like to, um, you know, to call us, but I mean, obviously medicine and law and, you know, our teachers and, and you know, there's so many different um, professionals that come together to, to help make the fabric of our cities. Um, and architects, we have the privilege of shaping the future of them, you know, with our design work. Um, but with density being, um, you know, what it is and, and what it will be, um, you know, I think that we, ha we have to be very cognizant of, of the, the work that we're doing and how it contributes to 
uh, to, health, uh, to health outcomes. And then if we go to the next slide, in addition to density, um, diversity or you know, heightened diversity in the US um, you know, will, will become more apparent. And you know, if you look at the numbers at the bottom of the slide, it, it talks about what I, what I just mentioned in terms of um, you know, the, the, the people um, or the, the population growth. But um, if you look at the, the charts or the, um, the, the bars there, um, you know, whites in America are going to um, re get reduced from 65% of the population, uh, which was in 2010, so 10 years ago. Um, but by 2050, it will be 46%. Um, and then um, we'll see a, a larger um, uh, population of, of Hispanic or, or Latinx um, people. And then uh, African Americans are staying around the same at 12%. Um, Asians are uh, increasing a, a bit, 8%, and then um, others are, are, are doubling, essentially. But the point is, you know, with cities becoming more dense and more diverse, um, you know, I think we have, you know, we, we have our work cut out for us as a society, um, but certainly as designers and, and um, you know, healthcare professionals and, you know, the whole um, range of people who are going to be working on the future of cities. But I think we have to take these numbers pretty seriously and know that if we um, can really work together to create, um, you know, better health outcomes, better economic outcomes, more, um, you know, essentially more harmony. I mean, I think that if we, if we don't, um, you know, take these numbers seriously and, and understand the demographics and how they're shifting and understand how density is increasing, then um, I think that we, we could potentially have, um, you know, just um, greater problems versus fewer. So, how do we design better solutions to the, the problems that we have now? Because essentially they'll only be magnified. I think that COVID really helped us to, um, to, to see what the problems are. Um, so now we have a, a great opportunity to address them. So that's, that's what we have. So Bon, I know there are um, so many good speakers here and questions and things. We thought we'd cut our time a little on the shorter side so we could engage um, questions or however you want to do that. Uh, great. So I had one. Uh, um, thanks for that uh, presentation. What are some ways that maybe cities and architects or healthcare systems are working together to address um, the COVID-19 pandemic? Have there, I've seen some stuff out there. Have, have you, is your firm doing work in this area or other firms that you know of? So we, um, I'll speak more for the University of Michigan. We started almost really an entire portfolio of research work. Um, we historically have always done clinical outcomes and we've gotten very good at measuring outcomes and claims data and insurance data. And um, we started to look at racial disparities, but in a much different way. So could you, um, you know, when you, um, certainly defer to um, Kimberly's expertise in this, in housing policy. The U.S. unfortunately has a history of housing policy that was explicitly favoring segregation. That was designed to actually segregate people, whether redlining um, or the way FHA allocated loans um, or the way um, housing projects were established. They were explicitly designed to segregate people. Now, those policies theoretically should have been overturned by the Fair Housing Act um, decades ago, but you actually can still see a lot of those patterns persist. So we've um, restarted a whole new line of work to take all the clinical outcomes that we measure all the time and connect them back to those neighborhoods, but not just to those zip codes and neighborhoods, but actually trace them back to the policies. And then you can actually start to identify 30, 40, 50 year legacies of segregation policy and racist policy that um, were not initially um, obvious. And I think in doing that work, as we started to think about it, one of the things that became clear is that you can have a system with no racist in it, but if you have racist policies and haven't addressed the legacy of that, then the system is systematically unfair. So we're starting to try to make those connections. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's absolutely correct. In fact, there's a great book, if anyone wants to, um, to read up on this more, it's called The Color of Law. Uh, and it just talks about the, the different policies that, um, you know, that essentially were designed to, to create this inequity that we're, 
uh, I think we're all suffering uh, from today because, you know, even though it seems as if a certain um, population of people are, um, you know, are, are more heavily impacted, you know, we're, we're all tied together in, in our cities and in our, our, you know, for our states and the country as a whole. Um, and so I think it's, you know, imperative that we, um, you know, that we do create, um, I think, cross, cross sector uh, solutions to, to a lot of the issues um, I mean, that's one of the things that we're looking at, um, at at HOK, just, you know, working with uh, with cities or with um, or with our counties and, um, you know, not for profit uh, sector leaders to to really create uh, kind of tri sector actually, uh, um, you know, also looking at academia, like how do we partner with different uh, with different entities uh, that have different perspectives on these really complicated issues, because we realize we can't design the solutions on our own and it's really going to require um, you know, a lot of different perspectives and a lot of experience from, um, you know, different uh, uh, areas of expertise to, to uh, really move the needle on these inequities. Great. Thank, thanks so much. I really, really appreciate the, the presentation. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Ellen Lupton, who is the senior curator at Cooper Hewitt at Smithsonian Design Museum in New York City. Thank you. I'm really excited to introduce Robert Fabricant and Pragya Mishra, who are joining us today from Dahlberg Design. They are applying human-centered design to global healthcare, social impact, and international development. Robert has written a new book called User Friendly, which I highly recommend. And they're going to talk to us about the global health practice at Dahlberg. So, Welcome, Robert and Pragya. Helen, thanks so much. And uh, I've had a chance to um, sneak into a few of these sessions so far. So it's great to be sharing some work. Uh, as a designer who's been doing this work for, for a number of decades now, the most exciting thing is to find myself in a community of practitioners that aren't designers, that aren't coming from that background to understand and learn about how they see the world and their work and think creatively about how design could be a pathway or a tool for greater impact. And I know a lot of people on this call feel this way. I'm gonna give you just a couple minute background to set the stage because we're gonna be talking about a bit more of the global health context, which some people here may have had a chance to um, get a little exposed to and some haven't. Um, so I'm gonna set a little bit of the stage of, uh, and then pass off to Pragya, who leads a creative director and leads our health practice to walk you through an example. And I think it relates to some of these themes as we think about equity, we find ourselves very often at that intersection of trying to figure out how you strengthen institutions and build capacity, um, both at a small and large scale. And the pandemic has certainly brought that to the forefront. Um, so Pragya, if we can go to slide two, I think Pragya is sharing her screen. Uh, in the same spirit, as I said in the introduction, um, me and, and, and a colleague joined a firm called Dahlberg because we were looking at how to cross-pollinate design in, into new fields and new issue topics. And a lot of what we saw was a huge creative capacity around the world uh, from the projects we were doing um, that wasn't really being nurtured and brought into these social and uh, civic issues. And so we decided to build a practice that's fundamentally dedicated to that. Uh, so we have a, now a global design studio, if you go to the next slide, um, Pragya, with small teams in Mumbai, Nairobi. Uh, we're starting up in Dakar now, New York and London. Um, and we bring together people and, and really try and cross-pollinate the work into the community-based organizations we work with, the governments, the NGOs, and the funders that we tend to work with, as well as within our own practice. We have uh, organization, rather, we have data scientists, we have quantitative researchers, we have strategists, we have people in, in finance and policy. So we try and put all that together. If you go to the next page, it won't surprise you given that footprint and the fact that, you know, for example, my team was the lead design partner to the Global Health Bureau at USAID, very early in the pandemic, we started to move into action. And so this gives you some idea. Uh, Pragya, it might be worth going into presentation mode. Um, we, we jumped into some very quick response activities. It was everything from creating uh, infographics to circulate in half a dozen languages in India to explain basic uh, health and sanitation practices, working with the Indian government on their WhatsApp service to get information out to people. Uh, in Kenya, Ethiopia, and Tanzania, launching uh, an initiative called Project Safe Hands that, again, tries to get sanitation and other tools into very dense, low-income communities. So we moved quickly. 
And there was a lot of very hands-on design work to do. But along the way, we kept coming back to, well, how do you, how do you coordinate this with governments? How do you do this in a way that strengthens, strengthens capacity, not in this quick response, but as the broader um, effort around response, rebuilding, reconstruction, rethinking the social contract. How do you make, how do you help that happen? And we know, we knew from other global health work that there was a need for a different kind of collaboration, uh, both within and across governments. And so that's really where this project picks up with some work in West Africa that, that Pragya and Trevor, who's also on the call led. So Pragya, if you want to pick it up, that would be great. Thanks, Robert. And hi, everyone. I'm Pragya. And um, I now that Robert's given us a little bit of an overview of what we've been engaging in in COVID-19, let me take you guys through a closer look of this one particular engagement where we used uh, human-centered design to support public health emergency operations centers in West Africa. And I know that's quite a mouthful, but essentially public health uh, emergency operation centers are um, this construct that was started uh, in 2013 when the Ebola outbreak happened. Uh, and these centers exist across various countries in the West African region, essentially for the purpose of uh, making sure that resources as well as technical expertise is available to these countries for uh, responding to pandemics and uh, any other threat to human health. Um, and I think it's important to highlight that uh, over time, uh, from Ebola to now COVID-19, as time passed, it will be realized that, uh, you know, EOCs in general can uh, lack internal procedures. So uh, it was all very spontaneous when uh, these EOCs came together. But uh, now, in hindsight, that we've had some time to think about it, uh, it's been pretty apparent that sometimes there's capacity missing, sometimes there's lack of technical expertise, there's not a very robust health system in many of these countries. So, uh, you know, how do you make sure that uh, when a pandemic strikes, uh, you're not only within a country be managing it, but you're also coordinating um, with each other and communicating with each other. So um, across the region, you can sort of uh, have a more coordinated response. And this is especially important because as we all know, uh, you know, <laughs> pandemics don't have boundaries and um, uh, there's a lot of movement of people as well as goods across the borders. So it's become really, really important for all of these countries not only to be focusing nationally, but also across, um, um, uh, talking across the table to each other. And uh, you can see on this slide that those six countries that we're focusing on were Mauritania, Mali, Senegal, Gambia, Guinea, and Guinea-Bissau. Um, and within these, I think um, one of the biggest things that we saw uh, was to make sure that we get all of these collaborators and stakeholders together, uh, including other regional actors who are quite strong in supporting these countries and, uh, you know, working through these pandemics like Africa, CDC, WHO, Afro, and um, our focus was essentially to bring them together to think through how we can um, build some sort of a collaboration or a regional platform that can help in exchanging information and supporting this outbreak together in real time. And this was especially important uh, and time sensitive because given the time right now, uh, you know, there's a very urgent need for this. Um, and we approached this through the lens of design uh, by starting with talking to each of these countries, their EOC coordinators. Uh, we also spoke to a lot of regional stakeholders uh, for understanding what the real system issues are and what the context of this pandemic is, uh, where there are key challenges and gaps to actually think through. Uh, and then we went into thinking about um, what some ideas and design concepts for filling some of those gaps could be and uh, how could we make uh, it a more strategic approach where we prioritize something for more near-term execution and then we can also have a broader vision in which we align our efforts across all of the existing partnerships and interventions already taking place in this uh, space. Um, and all of this to say that this was done in eight weeks and now we're actually going into the phase of implementing some of these ideas that came through and that's really exciting because um, through design we've been able to make the EOC coordinators speak to each other 
regional co regional stakeholders also co contribute to how some of this stuff should be shaped and then we've been able to uh, now pilot some of these ideas with them so um, that's been a pretty exciting phase uh, for the entire team that's working on this project and let me share a few high level um, takeaways that emerged from our research, but essentially there were a few key places where I think all of the EOC coordinators needed a few uh, more interventions or maybe some sort of support or even uh, more capacity. And this was around training, um, communication and coordination. Uh, in terms of training, specifically making sure that, you know, updated uh, most recent information is available. Uh, and in easy access for the EOC personnel to update themselves, but also uh, in terms of communication and coordination, making sure that um, information is being shared quickly and through cutting through all of the red tape that's available so that they can coordinate with each other. And then uh, in terms of knowledge, uh, I think one of the biggest challenges that these guys have faced has been through attrition. A lot of the staff keeps coming, going in and out, and doesn't necessarily. It's hard for EOCs to uh, sustain a critical mass of experts and people. So, uh, how do you quickly bring staff on board? How do you orient them? What can you tell them quickly about the pandemic so that they can respond? And then, lastly, which I'm guessing would not be a surprise to anyone in this group, but uh, you know, data for decision making and making sure that you have assets available so that alerts can be tagged things can be done in real time to take the most informed decision possible were all the things that uh, were sort of brought up. And I think um, from that, one of the things that uh, we realized there was the, there were these were a lot of priorities, but uh, we needed actually the countries to come themselves together and speak to each other and define what uh, what they want to prioritize immediately, what is it that immediately would get them going and support them in their initiative against COVID-19. Uh, so for the first time since the outbreak has happened, we got these six countries to speak together through a co-creation workshop, uh, well, remotely. Um, but essentially the purpose and objective of this workshop was for them to reflect on all of their challenges that they had surfaced through our uh, research, but then also sort of co-create and decide for themselves what would be the best suited uh, intervention for them to actually get some of this uh, going in terms of action or some actual idea or concept. Uh, and I think this was actually quite valuable to the EOC coordinators because they essentially, um, you know, got a chance to speak to each other, connect with each other, and then also uh, you know, debate what the key uh, idea should be and how they should design for themselves, which was a great uh, value add. From, the, from this uh, workshop, two big things emerged and two ideas emerged in terms of concepts. The first one was around um, their desire for a real-time data sharing and communication platform. And um, while the best version of this or the most ambitious version of this would be some sort of an integrated uh, you know fancy technology based platform the the like near term mvp version of what they wanted was essentially something with the tools that they're using that can serve two purposes one open up channels of direct communication between countries but two also uh, you know enable them to cut through the red tape and exchange information so um, we are actually piloting this now because this is something that needed to be done really quickly and urgently um, and we, we're already starting to kick this uh, communication platform off um, in on, next week i think august 10th so this is something that will happen uh, soon enough the other thing that they expressed was uh, their need around uh, building some sort of a train the trainer kind of platform and um, again, this was important for them because they want to keep updating themselves uh, with all of the available knowledge as uh, you know, we are learning more about the COVID outbreak and about the disease itself. And they want to make sure that they can then sort of pass this on, uh, pass this expertise on to the, uh, their own staff, to their own countries. So essentially, this is something that already um, WHO and Africa CDC are doing a lot of. And uh, our, our role here will be to essentially collate a lot of these materials and then make sure that we're uh, making it available for them. So 
I know I went through a lot um, really quickly, but um, essentially, I think we wanted to share this because uh, one of the key uh, ways in which design has been helpful here is to provide these six countries some sort of a co-creation tool that can help them in very dynamically um, creating uh, you know, prototypes that don't work and making it iterative, not waiting for the perfect answer, but just jumping in and lowering the stakes so that they can trust each other, co-create with each other, and design can work as almost like a glue or a facilitator. So I think that's been valuable and we'll continue to work on these ideas and uh, you know, work with these teams across for the next six months or so. But thank you. Thank you so much. I think we have time for just a couple of questions. There's a lot of really interesting uh, conversation going on in the chat about um, why can't we have an EOC or an emergency operations center in Philadelphia <laughs> or in the US? Like we seem to be so lacking the very tools that you're developing in West Africa. So do you have any advice or thought about how to um, create that kind of flow of information and co-creation, <laughs> um, you know, beyond the state of New Jersey? Actually, uh, that's a really good question, Ellen. And uh, I think in the, in the US, the problem has been uh, reversed, where there's a, a, almost a problem of plenty, where we, I just read an article yesterday uh, in one of the health journals about how Africa CDC had this one body to design, which was supposed to design what equitable vaccine access for COVID-19 could look like. And now they've posted it and they've made four other um, panels for this. So there's a lot of confusion on like who should make decisions and uh, how the vaccine should be distributed. So yeah, like there's that, but there's also definitely a need for, um, you know, employing non-traditional methodologies like design to make some decisions sometimes, because I think what that can do is lower the bar and make it okay to do quick and dirty things, but fail fast. Um, but yeah. Right, and the emergency encourages exactly. a little bit looser activity. Do we have time for any more questions, Morgan and Matt? I think that we don't. We um, are okay. actually going to ask Michelle Flood one question. I know we're getting really tight on time here, but we want to go ahead and answer a question. So I'm going to turn it over to Christy Shine for um, an audience question. Great. Michelle, thanks so much for your chat. Um, so you mentioned that you're working on the how might we statement of how might we leverage waiting time and routine healthcare. And one of the audience members, Natasha Goodwin, asked, do you think that this project can be broadened to tackle the problem of waiting in general? So for example, not just wait times at a clinic, but waiting for a diagnosis, and how could you see that applied? Yeah, well, it's a great question. Um, the best answer to that really is the clinics that they have established already at Delmed. So I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with them, but um, they've really reworked care provision and care delivery so that when a patient comes in to the clinic, um, the care is actually oriented ar around them. And you can do that with a greenfield green field site where you don't have existing structures. You know, they, and it's not without problem. But the patient comes in for a two hour visit. The um, clinicians and the clinical team are all kind of working together as a group. So with one visit, you could see two, three, four, five clinicians. So you don't have to wait for the physical therapist to refer you to the, the surgeon and you come back and you go again everybody is there together. So the physical therapist will just step out and say, hey, you know, to the advanced nurse practitioner or the surgeon, could you pop in and see my patient there in whatever room? And so I think that was a really clever way to sort of eliminate waiting through clever use of both space and time. Um, now, like, I think a lot of established services are a long way from that because it's very, very hard to restructure. But I think that's a great example of where it's been possible with the greenfield, you know, kind of site when you're establishing from scratch. But absolutely, I, I would, you know, think there's different ways to extend that. I'm so sorry we're over time because I went on for way too long, so I don't want <laughs> to be taking up more time with questions. That is totally fine. We are so glad to have you, Michelle, and everyone. Thank you, Robert, Kimberly, Andrew, Pragya, and Trevor for all joining us today. Um, and thank you also to um, Rob, Colleen, and Christy for helping us facilitate. 
next week is going to be our last episode and we are so sad but also so excited to hopefully see you guys all back with us um, next week we welcome our guests Mia Osaki Dr. Ijoma Azoto and uh, Natasha Margot Blum. So it's going to be an awesome conversation and we hope to see you guys all there. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs>